Good morning. Um, I am Dr. Robert Sivers. I am uh, a clinical physician and surgeon based in West Palm Beach and uh, Jacksonville in Florida. That's why I practice. Um, and I really want to thank Paul Mason and the Low Carb Down Under Low Carb All Stars for inviting me to give this lecture. And in this lecture, I am returning back to my roots. My roots are in carbohydrate addiction, both personally and in my practice. And I'm going to share my thoughts as to what carb addiction really is all about. Um, my background is that I am a clinical physician and surgeon. Um, I also have Facebook and Instagram accounts um, and a YouTube channel called Carb Addiction Doc. And if you want to flesh out any of this information, that's where you get additional information. My primary fiscal conflict is with New Era Diabetes Solutions, which is a, a charitable organization that I run. Um, and just on this first page, I also want to let you know that I am a founder member of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners that represents people working in the metabolic space. And I would urge anybody in the healthcare space, in the broad diversity, from athletic trainers all the way through to physicians, um, to please join this group. Because as a group, we have much better therapeutic carbohydrate restriction advocacy than we do as individuals. I am also a lecturer for uh, the Nutrition Network um, course, uh, where you can become certified in this form of practice. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let's look at um, our learning objective. <laughs> you know what? When I wrote down my learning objective, I just said, you know, here's what I want people to do. Through this lecture, I want you to sit back. It's not science. I want you to sit back and think and contemplate. That's the learning objective. So everybody, the majority of the lectures you're going to see in this whole series, the majority of things on the internet are people talking about how we gain weight and how to lose weight. And it's all about how, 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 and how the health works. And ultimately, it's very simple. The way we gain weight is when we consume energy beyond what we need. It's that energy in, energy out, calories in, calories out is absolutely 100% true, no matter what people that do what I do say about it. Energy in can be protein, fat, or carbohydrates. There's a certain set point of how much of that energy, different types of energy set points that we use based on genetics, the environment, our hormones, our culture, kinds of food groups, lack of exercise, and our psychology. And ultimately, Output is about physical, cerebral, and metabolic activity. There is no magic to that, no matter how much we want to spin that. And both great growth, as you can see in my little baby over here, this is Rian Sivas. He's nine months old. He's a pure carnivore, 98% uh, carnivore, and he's growing. Look at him. He is not missing meals. So uh, here you see Zach Bitter, who is the world record holder in the 100 mile, 100 mile records indoors and outdoors. If you look at Zach, he primarily eats a carnivore diet. He's ketogenic. However, look at how lean he is because he's running uh, more than a marathon as a training run. Then on this side, you've got Robert uh, Sykes, the Keto Savage, who's a power builder. You can see he's huge and he bulks up in order to train. And then you've got this picture I got off the internet, uh, which is of a highly morbidly, severely morbidly obese individual. Well, all four of these folks are growing or gaining weight. Um, is that obesity? No, obesity results from chronic excessive energy consumption greater than energy utilization. There's the answer to how. There's the answer to how. That's not magic. The issue, though, folks, is not how we get fat. The issue is why. The issue is why do we get obese? And that's what we're going to explore today. And I'll let everybody else talk about the how and what to do about, what, about how. So, one of the greatest cognitive dissidences in our society is that the majority of people in our society, healthcare workers and just regular human beings, believe that all of these problems that we're dealing with are the medical complications of obesity, whether it is uh, um, uh, lung disease or heart disease or gallbladder, it doesn't matter. We blame the diseases we have for the diseases we have, which is ridiculous. It's absolutely false. So this model of obesity is completely 100% false. Because here's the way it works, folks. 
medical complications of carbohydrates via insulin resistance causes all of these problems and also causes obesity. Obesity is not causative of very much. It hurts your ankles, your hips, your knees, your back. And most fat people don't look so good in the thong. <laughs> but other than that, obesity really doesn't cause a lot of diseases because it is the consequence of a disease called chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption that mediates disease via insulin resistance. And every other lecture that you're going to see in the series is going to discuss that. So the question, though, is why? Why do we become fat? So because people don't understand this and they focus on the obesity as a problem, oh, my goodness, we're all fat and sick and we're so... so we create these ridiculous diets that you see on this page to treat the consequences of an originally bad diet. And I don't care if it is low carb or Atkins or carnivore. I don't care if it's vegan or some, everybody's got a darn pyramid. Those are still ridiculous diets that we use to treat the consequences of a bad diet. And the proof of that is in a beautiful study by, by Danzinger in 2005, looking at the adherence and effectiveness of four popular diets, Atkins, Ornish, Weight Watchers, Zone diets, all various forms of caloric restriction. And the problem lies with the word diet because the science of the best diets is questionable if you look at these because they typically failed by eight weeks in a one-year program. And the Diets Fit study is showing the same thing, a year-long program where people are failing very early on. Almost all diets fail. Why? Because our current status of obesity treatment through all these various diets is erroneous and it's unsustainable for the rest of a person's life. We are imprisoned by our own cognitive dissonance that treating obesity is about some form of elimination or caloric restrictive diet. We are trapped currently, even in our own organization, we are trapped in insulin, glucose, lipid biology, and we're obsessed with eating healthy and we've demonized carbohydrates. So we blame the disease we have for the disease we have. Insulin resistance and obesity causes. No, it doesn't. Because we never ever looked at why at the relationship that makes us overconsume. <laughs> okay, folks, take a deep breath. Diets treat the consequence, not the cause of metabolic disease and obesity. So let's back this up to root cause. And, and in order to do that, let's take a break because everyone's sitting out there steaming, oh, you don't understand, you're wrong. Okay, so, so let's look at something very, very simple, folks. Let's look at smoking. And uh, you know what? Even the tobacco companies are saying smoking is really bad. So let's not look at smoking. Let's look at how smoking has evolved. Let's look at Juul. Juul is vaping or an electronic cigarette. And look right here. Here's your starter kit. Let's, so let's get started. Let's go and find out why 35 to 50% of American high school kids are already addicted to nicotine products. Yes, Juul is based on nicotine, which is a highly addictive substance. Why, 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 why? Why do people smoke? Why do people vape? You see, folks, every day, throughout the day, all human beings are encountering anxiety, stress, depression, anger, fear, frustration, sadness, boredom, pleasure. Together, I call, collectively call all of those things emotional tension. And all human beings, have a unique toolkit, a unique set of tools that we use when activated to dissipate the emotional tension. And that dissipation is done through a series of chemicals that are genetically built into our brain called the endorphin system. So when we use our emotion management tools, it, our brain gives us this wonderful reward of relaxation, of tranquility, of dissipation of emotional tension. And as you can see down here, our brain is very thankful for those rewards and as a reward allows us to function effectively as human beings when we dissipate emotional tension. Now, everybody has a variety of different things that we do as that emotion management strategy. However, if you start out life 
or you get to a point where you have an empty emotion management toolkit, where you have a comprehensive deficiency of effective emotion management strategies. As a young child, you build up all of those emotional tension. I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. And so many of our adolescents are suffering from anxiety, depression, and stress. And it's a horrible, horrible, horrible epidemic um, of mismanagement of emotional needs. And then at high school, you've got all this angst built up. And just to be sexy, just to be cool, somebody offers you a vape and you feel the unintended effect, which is this sudden, massive relaxation, tranquility, dissipation of emotional tension at a subconscious level. And boom, you're hooked. And you bond with that and you create progressively over time a relationship whereby you are continuously seeking opportunities to hit that vape, to give yourself that break from emotional tension. And if you started out with a comprehensively deficient empty toolbox, then vaping is so effective, why do you need anything else? So let's break this down. That's the example, but let's break down the methodology. You see, folks, there are two types of emotion management systems. And all of us are exposed to both of those. Let's look at the first type. The first type is called an instant gratification system. And in an instant gratification system, there's an upfront massive reward. So as soon as that kid puts that vape in their mouth, as soon as that nicotine hits the bloodstream, it goes straight to your brain, hits the endorphin center, and gives you that sudden burst of reward, that sudden relaxation, that instant emotional obliteration. But the problem is on the back end, that instant burst, that instant gratification is very short-lived. And on the back end, there is negativity, there is guilt, there is harm that is specific to the substance or the action. And there is erosion of self-esteem and self-confidence. But the most important thing about instant gratification is that while it's very effective at obliterating the emotional tension, it disconnects us from dealing with the issue that caused the emotion in the first place. So if I have a rough day and I have a fight with somebody and I come home and I smoke a couple of cigarettes, I hit my vape, I relax my brain, but I disconnect from the issue, from the fight that I had with somebody and I take that fight and I shove it into my subconscious, I'll deal with you later. And we call that psychologic hoarding. If you've ever looked at a hoarder's home, they've got piles of stuff that they may need later on, that they'll deal with later on, but they never do. And they've got these narrow corridors through their brain. Well, when you're using instant gratification systems, you disconnect from dealing with the issues and you shove them into your brain and your brain, your subconscious brain, looks just like a hoarder's house. We call that psychologic hoarding because the reward from an instant gratification system is a high. Now, there are two types of instant gratification. The first one is substance addiction, endorphin activating substance addiction. And we've got the classics. We've got heroin, cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, crystal, meth. On the other side, and this is what most people don't understand, on the other side of instant gratification, we have endorphin activating process addiction. Process addictions include things like gambling, gaming, anger, yelling, physical aggression, disruptive behavior, pornography, sex, perfectionism, control, spousal abuse, and cutting, where you intentionally hurt yourself for a pleasurable reward. The other form of emotion management, folks, is called an effort-based system, and all children growing up are exposed to the five pillars, or at least four of the five pillars of an effort-based emotion management system. And in an an effort-based system, there are three components. You have to put effort in up front. Then there's a time component where you connect with your meditative brain and the reward is on the back end. What do I mean by that? Let's say I've had that same rough day and I've had a fight with somebody at work and I come home and I leash up my dog and we go for a walk. Physical activity is a very powerful endorphin activator, but it doesn't do it in a spike like nicotine does. It does it gradually over time. So while I'm out in that walk, slowly, it doesn't matter how long or how fast or how far, my brain is relaxing. But because there's a time component, as my brain relaxes, 
I get into that twilight zone, that tranquil meditative zone, and now my subconscious can show me some of the issues of the day. And I'm now able to connect with those issues and process them, let them go, come up with a plan of action to deal with those emotions. So I'm putting the effort in as my endorphin relaxer. Uh, the meditative space allows me to deal with the issues. So by the time I come back from the walk, I'm relaxed and I've got a game plan for dealing with those issues. And the third component, if I allow myself to have unconditional pride of the effort I put into the walk, irrespective of the outcome, how long and how far doesn't matter. What matters is I'm proud of the fact that I went for that walk. And if I come back and I'm proud of the effort, the reward in tiny little increments is a rising of self-esteem, of self-confidence, of self-respect that I can then reinvest in other uh, forms of an effort-based system. And there are five pillars of an effort-based system. The first one we just talked about, which is physical activity. The second one is any of the creative arts. It could be reading, writing, sculpture, fashion, photography, gardening, music. It doesn't matter, but something creative that has the same three components. The third pillar is spirituality and meditation. And spirituality is not just church and Bible. It's more about an ongoing meditative dialogue that you have with a higher power seeking guidance to deal with issues in a relaxed state. The fourth one is empathetic human connection. And most people think they're pretty good at that, but empathetic human connection requires trust in somebody that they're not going to be judgmental or critical so that you can take the risk of being vulnerable in that space. But if you're not willing to take the risk, those issues, those things you're ashamed of and struggling with fester inside of you and are erosive to your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And the fourth one is healthy sexuality. And of course, a healthy person from time to time will use instant gratification techniques. I may go to Vegas and gamble a uh, hundred bucks. I may from time to time have a glass of wine, but I'm not using them in an excessive dominant way. So <clears throat> a healthy emotion management system is primarily founded. The foundation is effort-based. And every child is raised with exposure to both emotion management systems. Some are raised to incorporate a diverse effort-based system is a fundamental foundation of their way of life and become emotionally healthy, confident adults. However, some are unable to reap the reward on the back end of an effort-based system. They default into instant gratification as a system to fill the void. So how do we determine whether you're going to be effort-based or instant gratification based, and it's based on how we're raised. You see, all children are exposed to an effort-based system. They're all exposed to play and running around and, and human connections and some form of spirituality or meditation. Some incorporate that, some don't. Kids from either an authoritarian or a permissive family system are unable to develop an effort-based system as a foundation. What do I mean by that? Let's say I come home tonight and man, I've had a rough day. I'm going to take my dog for a walk. That's what I'm going to do. But just before I go, I'm going to have a couple of hits of, of Jewel and I'm going to relax. Well, half an hour later, you're sitting in a room full of a cloud of vape and you're so relaxed, the walk never happens. So a permissive person is somebody that doesn't have the structure to sustainably perform an effort-based system. They default to an instant gratification system that is readily there and that doesn't require effort. And the effort isn't put forth. There's no reward on the back end. Their self-esteem, self-confidence just doesn't develop. And they're happy-go-lucky, never are fulfilling or living up to the promise of who they should be. In an authoritarian family setting, the person raising you wants you to do really well. So they set ridiculously lofty expectations of you because they want you to perform at that level. And you put, you're very good at putting effort in, you put a ton of effort into something. But instead of feeling wonderful about the effort that you put in, you always seem to be falling short of that ridiculous expectation. Man, I'm gonna, I, I've had a rough day, I'm gonna go for a walk, I'm gonna put on my Fitbit, I'm gonna do 10,000 steps. And you come back and you've done 8,000 steps. 
And instead of saying, wow, I'm so proud of the 8,000 steps I've done, your Fitbit is screaming at you and telling you how pathetic and how useless you are that you couldn't even do 10,000 steps. And <clears throat> that gap between effort and expectation is filled with a sense of failure, a sense of never being good enough. And that sense of failure is highly erosive to the very thing you're trying to build up, which is your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And then you fill that void with some inanimate instant gratification system that on the back end, while it gives you emotional relief on the back end, there's no fulfillment. There's just feeling awful about yourself. On the other hand, a child who is raised to love and enjoy the effort, who's praised for the effort, that's where you create happiness and confidence. Never the outcome, always the effort. So if a child draw, paints a picture, Oh, that's a beautiful picture. No, I'm sure you had a wonderful, fun time drawing that picture. Praise the effort and you are authoritative. But less and less of our kids are raised that way. More and more we're competitive or not competitive, authoritarian or permissive. So now you get to a point where you say, oh man, this is rough. I'm, I'm really hooked on Juul. I hate this. I hate the smoking. I've got to quit. So you crumple up the cigarettes and you throw them away. And eventually, after a few failures, you're successful. The problem is by the time you are a regular smoker or vapor, if I look in your emotion management toolkit, you've got nicotine and carbohydrates. So while you may be very successful at quitting vaping or quitting smoking, you're now left with massive emotional deprivation. And when life throws a curveball, what are you going to do? So what common bad thing happens to people who successfully quit smoking. They gain weight. They gain weight. And here, folks, is the cause of why we get fat. In 2021, we are surrounded by carbohydrates and fat people are only happy when they're high. We are using Carbohydrates, obese and diabetic people and metabolically challenged people are using carbohydrates as a drug, not as food. And we have become a society that is dominated by carbophilia and lipophobia. Let's face it, folks. After a rough day, nobody gets high on steak and broccoli. Steak and broccoli are nutritionally necessary. But nobody gets high from those. Nobody rushes home and pigs out on a massive amount, a whole tub of broccoli or an 84-ounce steak. We don't get high from that, and our body will not let us overeat food. So understanding the genetic homeostasis, when it comes to food that is necessary for human survival, that genetic negative feedback, and the entire human body works on a negative feedback system when it's healthy. That negative feedback prevents harm. So nutrients, protein, fat, fiber, minerals, vitamins, micronutrients, electrolytes, um, and protein and fat as calories will never, ever get us fat or sick because our hunger center works on a negative feedback control system that stops us when we've had enough. Nobody knows how much they actually need. So for people to tell you this is the amount of calories you need is ridiculous, but your body knows. And you will not eat those foods to the point of excess where you become fat. My son is growing on that food. Uh, Robert Sykes is a power lifter on the power builder, uh, a muscle builder on those foods. Zach Bitter is running 100 miles in record-breaking time on those foods. But that fat guy in the middle, he's not using these foods He's using carbohydrates as a drug to get high. And carbohydrates are not necessary for human survival. There's a positive feedback loop. The more you eat, the more you desire, the more, the more high you get, you're chasing that high. And there's a massive propensity toward excess. And that excess over time causes harm. Carbohydrates are not essential for human survival. They give us enormous pleasure, enormous stressful emotion management. Protein and fat doesn't do that. They're essential. So carbohydrates are not necessary for human survival. Sugar and starch are drugs we use to obliterate our emotions. Those drugs have devastating mental and physical health consequences. And that I want to sink in. So let's compare the two. 
Because clearly from an evolutionary perspective, we did use carbohydrates as food. Because carbohydrates historically were a vehicle for nutrients. When you ate a tiny little sour apple that was ripe for a few months in the in the fall, yes, there was nutritional value. So we used it as a nutritional vehicle, but because those carbohydrates easily become fat, there was also a survival advantage. And therefore, genetically, we developed this high, just like we do from sex and orgasm, we developed this high for procreation, we developed this high for survival, for adding fat in the uh, few months before winter in the fall, when most carbohydrates are available. Um, peasant communities to this day use carbohydrates as food security, and every peasant community is based on rice, potatoes, or grain products as a fundamental survival strategy. And for a little while, we can tolerate the harm of transient insulin resistance when we're eating them, if we do not eat them often. These uh, carbohydrates are seasonally grown. And the most important thing, there's nowhere in nature where carbohydrates are combined with polyunsaturated fatty acids. Come to that in a second. So our access to carbohydrates was seasonal, environmentally regulated. And here they had nutritional, not emotional value, because hunger was a nutritional driver. And the reward for, for eating those carbohydrates was survival for the species. In the modern era, folks, pretty much everybody here lives within 50 yards or 50 meters of a tsunami of food. Food is no longer primarily scarce for most of us. Yes, there are pockets in the world where it is. But for most of us, carbohydrates have not become essential for life. They are ubiquitously available, as I said, and they have highly positive endorphin feedback of an instant short-lived gratification that defies negative homeostatic feedback. And particularly in the modern era with processed carbohydrates, they are often being combined with polyunsaturated fatty acids, which makes them highly desirable. Nobody's going to eat polyunsaturated fatty acids. Nobody drinks a mug of canola oil. But when you combine that with carbohydrates, those polyunsaturated fatty acids plus the carbohydrates make them highly desirable and highly palatable. And that excess, that chronic excess, not just seasonal excess, leads to harm, triggers the brain to desire those continuously and be in continuous opportunistic search for them. We've also simultaneously lost multiple multi-generational and clan-based parenting skills. So we're raising a group of authoritarian permissive ki kids who are leaning on instant gratification system, hunger, in the modern era is no longer a nutritional driver. It has become an emotional driver. When somebody says they're hungry, it is no different. As a high school kid saying, ooh, I need to go out and have some nicotine. I need to jewel. I need to vape. It has nothing to do with nutritional need. It has to do with endorphin need. And the reward, folks, is a high. Humans, historically, converted to a plant-based diet because of food security, not for, not for nutritional value. Human nutritional value, more and more, as we've, our brains have evolved, comes from animal products. By becoming plant-based, we give up nutritional health for food security. But in the modern era, that is not necessary. The plant-based movement is a dysfunction of who we are as human beings. Because carbohydrates are no longer used as food. They have become a drug used in excess as a dysfunctional form of emotion management. So let's look, like we looked at vaping, let's look at carbohydrates. The interesting thing about carbohydrates is most substances are uniquely substance instant gratification systems. So if a cigarette did not contain nicotine, nobody would smoke. However, and this is what most people don't understand, more and more we're understanding carbohydrates as alcohol, as nicotine, but there's more to this. Carbohydrates are uniquely both a substance and a process addiction. Clearly, the substance addiction is sugar and starch in any form. It doesn't matter if it's an apple or a donut. That's important to understand. It's sugar that enters the bloodstream. Oh, it's natural sugar. No. An apple and a donut has the same fructose and glucose. But we have to recognize that there's also a highly addictive process component. And in fact, there are two process addictions. The first one is snacking. A snack is always, 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 always an emotional event. It is calories for your head. 
And the second one is Rottweiler syndrome. What do I mean by Rottweiler syndrome? If ever you've watched a Rottweiler eating, no matter how much food you put in front of it, that Rottweiler will eat that food until it's gone and then it'll be begging for more. So insidiously over the last 50 to 70 years, our portion sizes, especially in America, have grown and grown and grown to be enormous. And along with that, our brains and our, our perspective of how much we think we need has grown along with that. And we completely override. We don't even have any satiety signaling. So Rottweiler syndrome is eating to the point of pain. Oh God, I'm stuffed, I hurt for that good feeling. Almost like someone who cuts themselves with a blade for that high on the back end. We're overeating for that high. So carbohydrate addiction is about sugar and starch, but also about snacking and Rottweiler syndrome, overeating. And that's why we've become obese. Carbohydrates are also ubiquitously available. It is impossible. It is impossible to get fat. You can gain weight, but it's impossible to get fat from eating food. Carbohydrates exclusively are the drug that make us fat, sick, and dead. And the question is, who and why do we eat carbohydrates to excess? And that's what we're going through today. So for those of you that are looking at metabolic disease, diabetes, obesity, Understand that the root cause has little to do with diet or food. And that's why in that earlier slide when it said carnivore diet or keto diet, or the problem wasn't with carnivore or keto. The problem was with the word diet because the root cause of obesity has little to do with diet or food. The root cause is dysfunctional emotional management, substance abuse, and addiction. And here is my definition of addiction. Addiction is when you use an instant gratifying endorphin activating substance or process to the point of harm and you ignore or distort the reality of the harm to repetitively engage in that relationship for the instant high. And the transition is from use to abuse to addiction where you've lost control and then to obsessive compulsive behavior. And there's a fine line if any line at all, between addiction and OCD. The other key things about addiction is the substance or behavior should not be necessary for human survival so that abstinence is possible. And along with the excess of use, there is an erosion of self-esteem and um, self-confidence and the nature of the harm is defined by the substance. So if you smoke, you're looking at lung disease and heart disease. If you drink alcohol, you're looking at DUIs and and, um, liver disease. And if you eat carbohydrates, especially with PUFA, you're looking at inflammation, you're looking at metabolic syndrome, you're looking at obesity, you're looking at diabetes. And folks, especially if you look at our youth, Over the last few years, there's been this unmentionable, massive rise in suicide because people are not coping. They don't have the tools or the skills, the emotion management skills to deal with the pressures of being young, the anxiety, the stress, the depression. And ultimately, if you look at the number of people that die because of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, the heart attacks, the strokes, the inflammatory diseases. Is eating excessive carbohydrates not just a form of slow suicide? And this is where we come in. This is where we can help. You see, alcoholism is much a hydration problem as carbohydrates are a nutrition problem. We really have to separate carbohydrate addiction from nutrition. Yes, nutrition forms a component part of this. Just like an alcoholic less to drink, just not water, just not alcohol. And an obese person has to eat, just not carbohydrates. But they also have to find other ways to deal with their emotions. So, okay, now we're going to help our people and we're going to put them on a no-carbohydrate diet. They're going to go keto or even worse. They're going to go carnivore instantly cut out the carbohydrates. Well, if you do that, and you do it from a nutritional or dietary perspective, you're leaving yourself with a comprehensive deficiency. 
of effective emotion management strategies. Because by the time you're obese or have type 2 diabetes, basically your emotion management toolkit has carbohydrates and cobwebs. And if you remove the carbohydrates, you leave yourself with comprehensive serotonin deprivation. That endorphin system has no form of resolution. And the reason ketogenic, intermittent fasting, carnivore diets fail over 98% of the time, like all other diets, and that is a true statistic, folks, it is because diets are intentionally deprivational. They kill your best friend without replacing them with a variety of other ways to handle your emotional needs. Think about this, folks. Everyone, oh, keto, keto, keto. Well, you go back 20 or 30 years ago, the Atkins diet was super popular. Everybody lost a ton of weight on Atkins. And the reason keto exists is because they all gained the weight back. And Atkins failed. No, Atkins didn't fail. It was great as a diet. It worked really well, as does keto. But paleo's come and gone. Atkins has come and gone. Keto will come and go if we don't change our approach. Because removal of carbohydrates without emotion management system replacement sets up relapse under emotional duress. So here's our plan. Here's the way we do it. There are four principles to carbohydrate addiction management. The first principle, what should I eat? And there's absolute boundaries, no carbohydrates. But within those boundaries, there's a huge variety. I don't care if you're mostly plant-based or mostly animal-based. Non-carbohydrate eating vegans who supplement adequately are as healthy, are as healthy as your strict carnivores, your strict keto people, because keto can go for that. We won't acknowledge that, but the majority of vegans are carbohydrate eaters. However, when they don't and they supplement some of the things that's missing in their diet, they can be as healthy as a pure carnivore. And we need to understand that plant foods and animal foods are absolutely fine as long as they don't eat carbohydrates. Now, any animal products in, my, in, in our plan, any animal products are fine. I don't care whether it's eggs, uh, dairy or cheese, red meat, white meat, poultry, um, fish and seafood. Those animal products typically don't have a lot of carbohydrates. They're fine. All vegetables contain carbohydrates, but all vegetables are free. I've never met somebody who, after a rough day, rushed home and picked out on a bowl of Brussels sprouts. It doesn't happen. So all these people that are, oh, you must eat this. You must, all the internet evangelists that have these specific beliefs about what people should and shouldn't be eating, they're full of it. The only thing an alcoholic should do is quit drinking alcohol. Nobody tells an alcoholic what they should drink, and we shouldn't tell people what they should eat. It should be devoid of carbohydrates. So when it comes to plants, there are only three absolute exceptions. No grains of any kind, and that includes all the keto grains. That includes almond flour and coconut flour and all the crap we use to bake foods that look like the foods that made us fat and sick. Oh, it's cauliflower rice. Oh, it's keto pizza. It's keto ice cream. BS, folks, it's ice cream. It's pizza. You've just shoved the word keto in, but your brain doesn't see that. Your brain sees pizza. And in the addiction world, you want to get rid of the names, the labels, the desires that trigger the emotional aspect. So no grains of any kind, no potatoes of any kind, no rice of any kind, and stay away from keto desserts. Keto lookalikes are as harmful. When it comes to eating, there are two condiments we want you to use with every food. Add a little bit of fat, fortify it, don't load it up, but whether that's olive oil, mayo, um, uh, coconut oil, avocado oil, uh, butter, ghee, tallow, eggs, Bacon, cheese, nuts and seeds are a great source of adding fat to your diet to get you into ketosis. And the second uh, um, condiment that we use is salt. That's the first principle, what should I eat? The second principle is when should I eat? And all the internet people love to, oh, eat when you're hungry. The problem with fat people is we're always hungry because a smoker always needs a cigarette. Hunger is about emotional management. It isn't about nutritional management anymore. And if you do intermittent fasting, if you go for three or four days without eating, your hunger goes away. So how is it possible if you're not eating, shouldn't you be super hungry because of nutritional deficiency? If you can't go six hours without eating, oh, I'm hungry. That is not a lack of selenium, folks. That's your brain saying, I need a moment and I need calories or carbohydrates 
to give me an emotional reprieve, just like a smoker who says, I need a cigarette. So when it comes to eating, we ask our folks to plan one or two, no more than two meals, plan those meals ahead of time. And then between those meals, use a bridge. That's my coffee. That's black coffee. It contains no calories. Just like gum for someone who's trying to quit smoking, coffee, water, Diet Coke, Crystal Light. I don't care if the internet evangelists, oh, it's healthy or it's unhealthy. I don't care what that is. As long as it doesn't contain cal uh, calories, calories and you build a relationship with it, that's a bridge item. Plan one or two nutritional consuming meals in anticipation, a little bit like you feed your dog and have those bridge drinks available for the emotional relief. So that little bit of coffee is a mind cleansing moment. It gives me a little bit of hydration. I can use that opportunistically because it causes me no harm, no tangible harm. Is it perfect? No, but it's perfect for me. And that's what matters. And add salt to your food. The third principle, Rottweiler syndrome. So the first principle covered what I should eat, getting rid of the substance addiction, sugar and starch. The second principle dealt with snacking as an emotional event. The third principle is dealing with Rottweiler syndrome. And allow your brain to decide how much you think you need to eat in the kitchen. Dish up half or less of that food and go somewhere else and sit at a table with a plate of food and a knife and fork and exclusively eat that food. Tiny amount. And when you're done eating that small amount with a little bit of fat and salt on it, maybe take a break, play a game of cards, go get check the mail, uh, talk to a friend for a few minutes. Give your brain a chance to relax and also give your naturally built in genetically based hormonal feedback system, what I call the leptinoid system, four or five hormones from the gut and the leptin from your fat cells to go to your brain and say, dude, you've had enough. Or, hey, you still need more. And if you need more, you go back to the kitchen, you get more. But most often, you won't need more. And then you've eaten appropriately rather than overeaten. And that's the way you turn the Rottweiler into a Chihuahua. The fourth principle, folks, is what I call wholehearted living. The fourth principle is consciously force yourself every day to practice and carve out time out of your busy life to practice the four principles. Creative arts, meditation, spirituality, physical activity, human connection, sexuality. And if you want a glass of wine, if you're not an alcoholic, that's fine. Give yourself endorphin time. I've never met a smoker who was too busy in their lives to have a cigarette, and I've never met a fat person who was too busy in their lives to have a snack. These are action snacks, folks. These replace consumptive snacks. And if you practice these and you're continuously looking for opportunities to practice these, they become your go-to when life throws you a curveball. Practice these on good days so that they're available to you on bad days. So treating carbohydrate addiction is to progressively remove carbohydrates change the snacking, change the Rottweiler syndrome, but simultaneously build an effective emotion management system that is based on effort to dissipate emotional tension, time to create and participate in the meditative space to process issues, and at the end, always unconditionally give yourself, approv yourself approval and pride to build self-esteem uh, and self-confidence. Because the goal of this program is health and happiness, and there is no outcome metric. Weight loss, resolving metabolic syndrome, putting your diabetes into remission are just milestones along a journey toward health and happiness. And yet, the most common thing that people blame for their relapses is stress. Oh, I was sure, oh, this thing happened, uh, this happened, or that happened, I went on a vacation, somebody... Stress does not cause relapses. It is the absence of an effective emotion management system that does. Building an effective emotion management support system is as important as not eating carbohydrates. However, quitting carbohydrates is like quitting smoking. Nobody, nobody does it well the first time. But every time you do it, your humility is greater, but your experience is greater still. 
And you keep quitting smoking, quitting smoking three, five times, and then you get it and it's done. Well, the problem with diets is, oh, Atkins failed. I'm going to try Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers failed. I went vegan. That failed. We blame every darn diet out there for failure. Everybody loses a bit of weight and then they gain it back because diets fail. When it comes to carbohydrate addiction, the problem is your relationship with carbohydrates and snacking. And every time you relapse, it's because you went back to carbohydrates as an emotion management tool under emotional duress. And you want to keep quitting and quitting and requitting until eventually you sustain the way of life because you don't need carbohydrates for their emotional needs. Weight management, folks, is about calories and pounds and kilos and keto and carnivore and intermittent fasting. That's when we treat carbohydrates as a source of calories. But obesity management, is about cognitive behavioral change, addressing carbohydrates as a drug. And you can't outsource that. You cannot outsource that. There are great strategies to lose weight. I'm a surgeon. I create weight loss in the operating room through surgery. But that's a tool you give people while they're changing their way of life. It is not an alternative. Because carbohydrates are not the problem. It is a person's relationship with them that is. And only you can decide whether or not you want to treat that relationship. As long as you make making excuses to keep those carbohydrates in your environment, oh, I can have 20 grams of carbohydrates, of course you're going to fail. It's like a smoker saying, I can have one light cigarette a day. But treating carbohydrate addiction starts with contemplating the surrender of your love affair with a drug called carbohydrates. And what we're after is emotional buoyancy, emotional resilience through empathy, gratitude, and kindness to ourselves. So I ask God every day to grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to improvement, Taking this imperfect world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that good enough is good enough if the effort is put forth, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and content with my assets, mind, body, circumstance, and soul. Folks, you can only find perfect happiness when you become content with your own imperfection. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Go to our YouTube channel if you want to flesh this out. And I really am humbled and thank Low Carb Down Under and the Low Carb All Stars for giving me the opportunity to present this work. Remember that the greatest glory in living lies not in never failing, not in never falling down, but in rising up every time we fall. With humility, get rid of your cognitive dissonance. And understand what your patients and the people around you and you yourself really need. Emotion management, not a diet. Thank you. Oh, boy, there was a lot in that, wasn't there, uh, Paul? But um, but carb addiction is something that really interests me. And and, uh, and the relationship between the carb addiction, inflammation, neurotransmitters, I know you've got some thoughts on that. Where do you think that all sits? Well, this is quite interesting. So when we have a look at the uh, literature on people with celiac disease, so we know this is an autoimmune inflammatory disease, a reaction to gluten, that we know that when the disease is poorly controlled, the level of these neurotransmitters in the brain, like serotonin, which are responsible for you know uh, mood control and cognitive function and things like that, that actually falls in the inflammatory state. So they've actually done some studies where they've sampled what we call the cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid around the brain in patients with celiac disease. And they found that when they're eating gluten-free diets, their level of serotonin is greater than when they're consuming gluten. And I think this just adds another layer. It's a complex tapestry, as Robert was talking about, but it just adds another layer of understanding that uh, we also have to consider the the effect of autoimmune inflammation uh, and what it can do on people's uh, 
craving habits and their tendency to binge and so on and so forth. And I certainly know that uh, with my patients with autoimmune inflammation, when we are able to reduce their inflammatory levels, that their ability to control what they eat and their urgence and binge eating episodes and things like that, they all improve dramatically. And do you think that has a direct effect on neurotransmitter levels? Well, absolutely. I mean, we do know that uh, chronic inflammation actually leads to iron sequestration. It basically makes uh, iron unavailable for use. And if we have a look at what we call the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, then they all uh, they all have iron-dependent synthesis. Basically, iron is necessary for the body to actually make these neurotransmitter levels. So there's very good um, biochemical um, mechanisms which would actually explain how inflammation actually leads to uh, reduced uh, production of these chemicals, notwithstanding that if you've got an inflamed gastrointestinal tract, it could actually lead to specific nutrient deficiencies like B12 and zinc, which are also necessary for synthesis of some of these products.